Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you with us. We are now in the midst of the longest government shutdown in U.S. history. While all the others, like the one lasting 21 days when Clinton and then House Speaker Newt Gingrich went at it and squared off for 21 days, and Jimmy Carter's 18-day shutdown so he could say no to political pork, and then the next longest one under Obama to save the Affordable Care Act, while they've all been really politically contentious, this one has onerous overtones. Trump, leading up to all this, has called out the army to the border with Mexico. Thousands of children have been separated from their families. For this particular shutdown, federal employees had their financial backs against the wall. And indigenous people, their lives and livelihoods are under threat in this country. When Trump threatened to call a national emergency to build his wall between us and Mexico that most Americans do not support, it set off alarm bells across the political spectrum. Even conservatives became wary of his next moves. Progressives and libertarians, too, saw this as a threat to our very democracy. So what could be the political consequence of all of this? What are the dangers that lurk ahead and beneath us? And what should our response be? We are joined by Lindsay Kashkarian, who is Program Director for the National Priorities Project over at the Institute for Policy Studies. We wrote an article in Truthout entitled, Will the Longest Shutdown in U.S. History End in a Power Grab? And Lindsay, welcome back. Great to have you with us here on The Real News. Good to be here. Always good to talk to you, really. So let me begin by playing these two clips. The, 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 this first clip here is a clip of uh, Trump talking about why he all of a sudden doesn't think that we should have a, a national emergency, but hedges some. Let's hear this. I'm not looking to call a national emergency. This is so simple, you shouldn't have to. Now, I have the absolute legal right to call it, but I'm not looking to do that because this is too simple. The Democrats should say we want border security, we have to build a wall, otherwise you can't have border security, and we should get on with our lives. He has every right to call a national emergency, he says, which is one of the things that prompted, I'm sure, Lindsay, for you to write the article you wrote. <laughs> and all of us just hold our breath. What is he saying? But then, just more recently, I think it was on the 11th, he said this, to backtrack a little. Mr. President, what's your current thinking on a national emergency? Why didn't you announce it last night, and when might you... Because I think we might work a deal, and if we don't, I may go that route. I, I have the absolute right to do a national emergency if I want. What's your threshold for when you might make a deal? Uh, my threshold will be if I can't make a deal with people that are unreasonable. So uh, some people uh, had a sigh of relief Lindsay, I don't think this is, gives us much pause for a sigh of relief because he's leaving a lot of room open to come back to a national emergency. And you kind of clearly outlined in the piece you wrote what the dangers are that's ahead of us if this should happen. Right. Well, true to form, this president always flips back and forth. So, no, I agree. We, we can't take him at his word that he's not declaring a national emergency. Um, all we can do is wait and see whether he reaches a point where, for some reason, he decides to declare one. Um, what's unprecedented about this is not the national emergency. There are lots of national emergencies. Presidents declare them all the time. But this would be a really unprecedented use of a national emergency. Usually there are things to do with foreign policy, um, sanctions on other countries, uh, things about suspected terrorists. Um, of course, Trump is saying that this is about suspected terrorists. But what it's really about is this humanitarian crisis that he's creating at the border. Um, and he's politically backed himself into a corner, and that's where the national emergency may come in. The thing that I think some people fear really here with all of this is that something you just alluded to, um, and, I, and I think that his back is against the wall. Uh, there have been all kinds of reports from inside the White House, you know, whether they're verified or not completely, you don't know whether, they, whether he was saying we're being crushed and, and the rest. He's a very volatile character, um, and we don't know what he may say or do next. And if he was to call a national emergency to say we have to build this wall, and as I think he put it, taking money away from other relief projects that we can talk about here with it as well. I mean, so what's the, what's the political danger here? I mean, what do you see as somebody who watches this carefully? Well, one thing is the precedent, right? I mean, if you've been on Twitter and you've seen sort of jokes about the precedent and, you know, if this president declares a national emergency to build a wall, what's to stop the next Democrat from declaring a national emergency to uh, say address climate change. Now Democrats see that as you know maybe a desirable thing, and Republicans have you know Senator Mark Rubio brought it up as kind of a horror story. Oh my God, what if this happened? Um, but the truth is that 
it would be a really disturbing precedent because regardless of what this president does and the next president does, uh, national emergencies are a really powerful tool that presidents have. Um, and they can even use them to do things like freeze Americans' bank accounts or shut down electronic communications. So this is really playing with fire and a different level of authoritarianism than anything that we've seen from this president so far. And they, 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 this is a question I think is really important to ask here, because that, that you, what you just said. How real a danger do you think what you just posited is that we face? I think we don't know as much about that as we as we wish we did. Um, you know, I mean, it may seem like it's a long distance from building a wall to shutting down electronic communications, but you know, those things could happen piecemeal. Um, and what's part of the danger is that if the president declares a national emergency, there will be a lawsuit, um, no question about it, um, possibly multiple lawsuits. And as those lawsuits work their way through the courts, they're going to set precedents as well. Um, that future courts will be bound by. So how this all goes down right now could set precedents for American history for decades or, or more. And who's to say what kind of leader we're going to have? I don't think, you know, not a few years ago, many, not many of us saw this one coming down the pike. You know, one of the things I, I want to posit here to you, uh, and, I, and I, uh, that some of us been wrestling with a bit, is that we have a situation now where you have this really for one of a better term at the moment, white, very racist nationalist grouping in the White House controlling a lot of the politics of this nation. With their allies, some of their allies in Congress, and, and 25, 35 percent of the American population that really likes what he, they see every day in Trump. On the other side, if he, if he declared a national emergency, I just want to set up a little kind of sci-fi scenario for a moment here. So, so, if, so if he did that, then you also see on the other side, the FBI, the CIA, uh, parts of our military leadership are now the saviors of the nation who don't like what Trump is doing. Right. This sets up right. a the, really very strange scenario for us. Yes, it's the, the strange alignment of progressives with the FBI and the CIA. <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's true. And, and you know, you, you brought up an important point, which is there's this minority of Americans that want this and support this. Uh, but we have polls that say that you know, the vast majority of Americans support immigration and want immigration and think immigration is a good thing. Im the majority of Americans don't want a wall built. The majority of Americans think that $5 billion would be way better spent on education or health care or infrastructure. Um, and we've also seen that as this shutdown drags out longer and longer, the president's poll numbers are starting to slide even lower than they have been. Uh, so it is a small minority against the vast majority. Uh, and it's important to remember that. I may, have, I, may, I may have said it with a little bit of a chuckle, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm very worried. I think many people are at this possible scenario being built up and what could actually happen with these two forces in America, none of which represent the kind of progressive future that I think most Americans really want and what that could do. Um, on the other hand, there's also the economic pressures we're seeing here. We're seeing that that the, the, the that most federal workers now have lost at least five thousand dollars from a pay, from their wages, and that keeps to be growing. So the economic consequences of this shutdown are very serious. They're very serious, and they're getting worse by the minute. Um, you know, for one thing, the only solution to this shutdown is not a national emergency. The Senate can end this whenever they want to. Um, Senator Mitch McConnell holds the answer in his hands if he chooses to use it. Um, but yes, the economic consequences are growing more serious. Um, so far, it's you know coming down mostly on federal workers and federal contractors who are not getting paid, 800,000 people uh, who are not getting paid, and more than half of them are being required to work while they're not getting paid. And just to put that into context, 800,000 jobs is about the number that we were losing every month during the Great Recession. So it's a huge economic effect. It's not something to be taken lightly. And we're seeing reports now that it may actually start to tank the economic growth that the country's been seeing for the last couple of years. So now, uh, how, okay, playing that a little further. So how, how do you see that playing out? I mean, you watch the economy all the time. How, how, what, what, are the, what could be the consequences of this? Well, I mean, there's all of this, you know, sort of investor confidence and things where there is a lot of a big part of the market that's psychological. And right now, the country is in an extremely volatile state that is not good for the economy. Um, and we're going to start to see that 
kind of people start to pull back from the economy the longer this goes on because they don't know it's too unpredictable what's going to happen if people kind of aim to play in the economy. And then the other thing that we know that um, hasn't become terribly serious yet, although we're starting to see some really bad things, um, is people who are on public assistance, people who rely on housing subsidies, people who are in public housing, people who rely on food stamps. Um, all of those people, all of those programs are running out of dollars. And as this shutdown, if it stretches into February and even into March, um, all of those programs are running out of money and people are really going to begin to suffer. Yeah, just to finally close out here, I mean, I think that what, that's one of the things we're seeing. And I think that the tip of the iceberg here is what we're seeing is happening in Indian country where people are just losing everything. I mean, there's, the medical care system is falling apart. There are no jobs. People can't get money for the feed their children. Food is running out in the pantries. I mean, and it's becoming a crisis on a lot of reservations. In, in Native, yeah. and, and that could be emblematic in a, large, in a larger scale of what could be happening in America if this is not taken care of soon. That's right. The Indian country is very dependent on federal funds that they get because of treaties that were signed long ago. It's the federal government's word that, you know, in exchange for some of the horrific things that uh, the federal government did to these people, that they get these funds. And they're absolutely suffering. They're shut down. Most of their funds come from the Department of the Interior. That's the department that's part of the shutdown. And so, for example, uh, the Indian Health Service, it now is not funded. Uh, they have about 60 percent of their employees who are currently still working without pay so that they can try to provide health care. Mm. There are 2.2 million people who get health care under that system, and it, it's just not going to work. There are too many people, there are too many needs that can't be met. Well, Lizzie Kashkarian, I, I always enjoy talking with you, and I, and I really keep up the work in your writing and all the research you're doing and, and uh, being on the front lines for us here with this, and I look forward to talking to you again. Hopefully, not with a continued shutdown, because I do truly worry about our economy. I worry even more about the American people and what's going to happen with all this. But, Lindsay, thank you so much for your work, and thank you so much for joining us today here on The Real News. And thanks for having me. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Thank you for joining us. Take care.